very good evening everyone. Welcome into your box seat brought to you in association with uh, Woodland Star. Yes, first show of 2020. Michael Guerin, very good evening to you. Looking forward to what should be an action-packed show because we've got a whole lot to talk about. Welcome back brother. Happy New Year for those in the harness racing world we haven't seen in 2020. And what a remarkable, remarkable start to 2020 it has been. Some amazing action on the track, but Greg, the absolute story uh, of 2020 so far, and you got the exclusive with Ricky May coming up very shortly. The remarkable, remarkable scenes and aftermath out of Omakao for the Central Otago meeting on January the 2nd. Um, people watching this show have seen most things in harness racing. You and I have seen plenty as well, but I've never seen anything like that. No, it was uh, truly remarkable. You did right. That's the best word to describe it. And last Friday, I got the chance to sit down with the wee man with the gold hat and have a chat about the experience that he's just been through and what's ahead in the future. G'day Dave, you know who's speaking? <laughs> yeah, I know, you're not the only one that said that to me, but um, no, nah, it's good to, good to hear your voice too. Yeah, no, I'm getting better every day. Um, still got plenty of aches and pains, but that's only natural for what I've been through, I think. Ricky May chatting with race caller Dave McDonald. It's a conversation he's had a lot lately, but one he's thankful to be having at all, since his well-documented medical event at Omakau on the 2nd of January. I've always said you're a lucky bugger. If something like this is going to happen at a racetrack, on a bend, where Ali Barron, who knows a bit about this stuff through being a physio and was, was right on hand. A couple of doctors, Dr Kim Lawson being, being one, off duty, there at the racetrack. The paramedics there. Like, if you'd done it at another bend, things might have been different, Ricky. So, and for old AGs just to pull up as well, um, there were a few things played in, played in your favour there, weren't there? Oh, definitely, yeah. Well, like I said, I can't remember anything about going out to the race. I can't remember anything about the race. I can't remember a thing. What he can remember is reigning home the aptly named It's All Down to Luck to win earlier in the day. The irony in the name is not lost on anyone. This is game over. It's all down to luck is going to bolt in. We'll beat Scotland's beat. It's the last thing I can remember to be fair. I actually remember winning the race and coming back to the birdcage and I remember Graham Cinnamon saying to me, who's the president of Omakau, he said to me, oh, congratulations and thank you for coming and thank Benny and Mark for bringing their horses down. And that's the last time I can remember anyone talking to me. Ricky isn't interested in viewing the footage of the Omakau Cup, but despite the very public images in front of a packed holiday crowd, Ricky knows if he'd been anywhere else, the outcome may not have been as positive. Good spot to be, you know. Um, I think um, Lawrence McCormick actually was the first person there and he must have took my helmet and that off before Ali got there and then, um, um, you know, and then she obviously did what she did. Broke a few of my ribs, but <laughs> I'll always come right. A doctor of the Dunedin Hospital said if she didn't do that, I wouldn't be here. So I certainly got a lot of thanks for these people. Yeah, Graham Me, he was the clerk of the course. He, he took care of uh, the horse as well, AG's White Sox. And um, it, it's times like this, Ricky, that we really recognise what some of these people do. I think your um, main paramedic on the day was Barry Yunson. Um, often you have Dave, the, yeah. the other um, paramedic down there, Dave Hay, who, who's taken care of you a few times. Yeah, um, yes. This is when they really come to the fore, those guys, isn't it? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Well, they got all the gear as well. Uh, you know, um, just going back, Lawrence McCormick said that I was actually still actually breathing when he got to me. Um, but he said I was no good. I was struggling to breathe in that, and when Ellie arrived, I definitely conked it then. So, you know, obviously, you know, um, yeah, what Ellie did, and then the ambulance arrived not long bef after. It sort of probably saved my life, yeah. Dr. Kim Lawson, good that she yes. had some horses in that day. <laughs> um, she was on course as well, and, and you know, you, you think of guys like Dave McDonald, who you've just caught up with on the phone, who have been through. These sort of situations, but far worse outcomes. So, um, yeah, it, it was hard on a lot of people, wasn't it? Oh, no, definitely was. I didn't know I had so many friends in New Zealand and Australia, to be fair. I, I mean, on, on Facebook, the face, people on Facebook, 
texts, telephone calls. It's just gone on and on and on and all. My family have had that much response. It's just incredible. Just didn't know I was so popular to be fair and uh, it's good to be here to thank them. Ricky also comes out a bit of luck again. They couldn't get one helicopter in, so they got the <laughs> state-of-the-art helicopter, the $12 million job coming and picked you up as well. So, yeah, oh, there's, a, there's, there's just an ounce of luck in all of this, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah, well, I think uh, the first helicopter had come in, um, they actually did something, helped do some other procedure on me as well, and then with the fog in Dunedin, they couldn't get in. And funny thing, about two weeks before, I remember reading about the state of the art helicopter, most just got everything in it, like all, almost an operating table. And uh, to get it in, they said I could have stayed on the track, you know, for another 24 hours with it, because it's just got everything inside it. So it was a funny, I was just reading about it. And then the other thing is that I've always supported Westpac Helicopter, I've always given donations. And Judy asked me why I keep giving it, and I said, oh, just one day I might need them, and <laughs> sure enough I did. Yeah, the 2nd yeah. of January 2020 was the day you, you, you did. Okay, so you, you get to Dunedin, they put you in an induced coma for a couple of days, and um, you come out of that and you're surrounded by your family. I, I, I know that it was pretty emotional for you. You must have thought, what the heck's happened here? Oh, I definitely did. It. Like I didn't know where I was. I, I do remember waking up and just looking at the roof and well, where the hell am I? You know, I didn't have one one clue in the world but um, I think uh, Judy and Kate were in the room when I woke up and I kind of knew them straight away so I think the doctors were pretty wrapped about that. The boys came down, Philip and Timothy and, <laughs> yeah. and they've been to the fore since then haven't they? You've got 200 acres here, there's a, there's a bit of work to be done around here Richard and, and they've, been, they've been massive haven't they? Oh definitely yeah, the whole family have actually but the two boys have taken over the farm and uh, if they're not busy enough you know, they're flat out run their own business, but they're, they're here every day, both of them. So, yeah, no, they've been great support. A hypertopic obstructive cardiomyopathy. She's a big old name, isn't it? <laughs> you, won't, you won't try and work out exactly what it means, but you're basically blacked out. And um, subsequent to that, you've had a fibrillator put in to, to help with that situation in the future. But you were telling me, the doctors have said you, you, you're as strong as an ox and, and basically... Um, you'll, you'll be as strong as you've ever been. Yeah, no, they um, don't see any problems. They said that, well, obviously they scanned me at Dunedin and said that my heart's just perfect. I haven't got not one thing wrong with it. It's just the, the body fat around the heart. It's just, or muscle, sorry. Yeah, it's not fat, it's muscle. Just, he said, in fact, I'm too fit, but it's a bit hard to believe. But, <laughs> well, you uh, don't slow down, to be fair. Once you've finished on the farm, you're race driving, and maybe this is something that might change your life a bit? Is that is that how you see it? No, oh, I probably will, Greg, actually. It's been a pretty big shock um, to everyone, really. So, yeah, probably time to start slowing down a bit. In saying <clears> that, <throat> it's all down to luck was winning drive 2,949. There's still a real desire to get back out there, isn't there? 3,000 are beckoning. Yeah, well, um, yeah, evidently, uh, when, <laughs> when I woke up, I must have said, once after I got explained everything, I said, oh, That'll be it, I wouldn't go back again, but after a few days lying in hospital, I, I just thought to myself, I just couldn't go out on that note. I was, I'll have to have another go if, if the trainers want me to drive their horses and owners, but um, um, yeah, I couldn't see why I sh you know, shouldn't really. And they're telling you, the, the medical people, that you're going to be as fit as ever, so what is the short-term prognosis, if you like? What, what's the, the process from there? You've had the procedure, procedure to put the uh, fibrillator in, so what have they told you, just to take it easy for a wee while? Yeah, well, actually, the doctor, um, Ian Crozier, is a bloody hard thing. We're talking about farming while he's doing the operation or procedure, and uh, he uh, he said to me, oh, I'm just going to have to have you know, two or three weeks quiet, and he says, then he said, just get on with life. That's what he told me, so he, um, he didn't see any problems at all. He said I was sort of you know, pretty fit in that, so he said he shouldn't have any problems at all. Knowing you and your <laughs> wife Judy, she'll be keen for you to get back out on the farm as well. I suppose it's not far from harvest time, so you'll be chomping at the bit, so to speak. Yeah, no, I, you know, probably going to start in the next probably 10 days or two weeks, so I couldn't see why I couldn't drive the heater. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to catch up with you. I know there's a lot of people, you say Australasian wide, I can tell you it's worldwide. People were uh, very concerned and I'm sure they'll be pleased to see this wee piece and uh, it's great to have you back wee man. Oh, thanks very much Greg and I'd just like to thank everyone for supporting me so much. I mean, 
just had that many texts and that I couldn't reply to everyone and, and some of them were quite humorous as well that um, you know I could only pro probably reply to half of them to be fair but it just got a bit much um, you know some of them um, brought a tear to my eye actually so I'd just like to thank everyone that supported me. So that was a great opportunity to sit down with Ricky and, and have a chat and, and you could hear by the way he was talking um, the emotion around the whole situation look he was back home within eight days um, he clearly has no inclination to watch the footage and I and many other people have said to him I don't see any reason why you would and um, that's why we haven't shown it as part of the show out of respect for Ricky but um, he's bouncing back he had that trademark smile and, and giggle a couple of times and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to see and when we get through the show today Michael will see that horse AG's White Sox uh, back in winning form as well so um, yeah interesting scenario over the last three weeks for him. Yeah, and we've got to thank Ricky and Judy and the rest of the family for letting us letting us bring you that information because I haven't been involved in many things in harness racing where so many people were concerned. I was getting calls from from jockeys overseas saying, "What's what's happened to Ricky? How's it going?" It looked horrendous. We're not going to show it to you, but everybody's seen it, and we all feared the worst, because you do, and your mind craves information, and you want things to be good, and there were that many rumours swirling around, and we now get to this level, which is the fact that Ricky is okay, and he's had the operation, and it makes you think of all the wonderful people who are involved, from Ali Barron, who is a first responder situation, to all the people who are doctors and fly helicopters for these sort of things, and that affects people's lives all the time, Greg. People in car accidents, people who have tramping accidents, a million different things. And you realise how important these people are. So I, I said to people for a long time, people ask, you know, of all the sports people I meet and the harness racing people, who your heroes are. Those people to me are really good at a job and that's great. But heroes are people who look after people in hospitals and, and so run into burning buildings and stuff. And, and we saw that on January the 2nd. Great that Ricky's going to be back in the sulky, we would think. Um, well, he's got some unfinished business. He's he only 51 short of 3,000, and the doctors have told him that he'll be stronger than ever. So there's no reason to, uh, that, he, that he won't actually get back when that period is and how long that takes. Um, he should just take his time. He's got four broken ribs and a couple of cracked ribs, so there's a bit to, uh, to be well, healed in, there. In those situations, Greg, when a horse falls or there's a bad smash lot, the one at Cambridge we'll talk about shortly, you always think what the other scenario was, and the other scenario in this case was was horrific. So that didn't happen. Ricky, I'm glad you're fine, and thank you, Judy, for, for letting us into your life over the last three weeks. And uh, I think that, yeah, I think when Ricky does eventually, which I'm sure he will do, drive another winner next time out, and there, it'll be pretty emotional scenes for everybody. But... Uh, I'm glad the show is starting the way it is for 2020, Drew. Yeah, absolutely. What about Cambridge? You've got an update on what was a, a pretty bad sort of a smash too. Yeah, so a couple of days later, for those who didn't see it, at Cambridge we had an incident where a horse was was, was um, on, racing on the speed, had a gallop, very innocuous incident. Another horse ran up the back of it, then skewed right, and because they're going full speed, there's nowhere to go. So four horses either hit the track or lose their drivers. Um, David Butcher was the least affected of the drivers, so David has been fine. Let's go through the others. Matty White, because um, several of these drivers got catapulted to the track, and Matty was thrown quite a long way. Spoke to him. Uh, his concussion is clearing up. He's got two broken bones in his back, but not no spinal cord damage, which is obviously the crucial part. And he's hoping to be back driving in the next two weeks. So... Maddie's come out of it pretty well. Trademark, he's got his laugh and his smile going on and he's feeling pretty good about life. Todd McFarlane spoke to Todd yesterday. Broken hand and wrist. Operation last week to have plates inserted. So he'll be in the cast for another month, probably longer. Todd was thinking two months away. Team's been looked after well. He's got good staff. Um, trying to be as positive as he can possibly be. Jay Abernathy returned to the doctor today and we won't have an update on that yet. Um, fractured wrist uh, in a cast, which is not much fun in summer. If you've ever had a broken arm in summer, it's not a lot of fun, it gets pretty warm. He is hoping he doesn't need to be pinned or plated, Greg. And again, he's thinking maybe two months is the best case scenario, possibly three. Now obviously wrists and hands for both Todd and Jay are really tricky areas for harness racing drivers because you do carry a lot of weight in those areas. Uh, it looked really bad. Um, Again, it's not great for those guys. Jay's team's being looked after as well, so they'll still have racing income, we hope. But again, it could have been a lot worse. 
But um, for, for Jay and for Todd, um, if your mates are there, just give them a text or give them a call because when you're laid up, Greg, it's, it's pretty boring. To be yeah, honest. it is. And, uh, of course, the horses came out of it OK. And a little bit later on, we'll see AG's White Sox. There was no uh, effects, ill effects uh, for him. We're about to take a short break here on your box seat. When we come back, we'll review some of the stuff that we haven't been able to do while we've been away and a whole lot more. Back into your box seat, of course, with Woodland Stud. They stand uh, what the hill. Chance for us to go back and have a look at some of those races uh, while we've been away. Of course, we had New Year's Eve, self-assured, winning the Auckland Cup. Um, was a terrific afternoon, evening there. But Cambridge had their big night uh, under the lights, of course, on January the 10th. The first we want to have a look at uh, here is Oscar Bonavina. And uh, he was quite brilliant, as he was in the Flying Mile on Christmas Eve, Michael. Yeah, I think he's best served at this stage of his career, that's him coming down the outside, with one run at them. I think we saw in the National Trot 10 days before this that he's still not big enough and strong enough to sit parked in this grade and just beat horses for fun. But with speed, he'll beat them for fun. Massive Metro, who runs second here, will go forward to the Dullard Cup and the Great Southern Star. But the horse who really impressed me was Winterfell because... I've been waiting for him to trip up again, particularly back left-handed, and he was very good there. So Winterfell's won me over in the last six weeks. The Inter-Dominion was excellent, but the national trot in this race indicated that he, he wants to be a racehorse at the moment. Oscar Bonavine is a funny one. He's incredibly fast, but a little bit like self-assured last week, which we'll show you shortly in the Ballarat Cup. You don't just turn up and win these races. And, and we are, the markets are framing Oscar Bonavina, even this week in the Dullard Cup, as, oh, he'll just be too good. But it's not quite that easy, Greg. And as, as we saw in the National Trot, he's not good enough to rough and tumble and just beat these horses for fun. Not at this stage of his no, career. No, exactly. And he is only four. Not yet. Agree. Like, you know, he's and very he's not much a, in he's the not infancy a big, of his career. Horse. He's no. not a big bully of a horse. In saying that none of the other horses in this grade are good enough to sit parked and win either. But the market isn't framing them as horses who can do that. Mm. Well, it's framing him. The hype's actually got too big on the horse for the markets for what he is. He's exceptionally good, but... He's not he, there yet. Well, look, he's not $1.50 for these races. Every he's, time he lines He's going up, around no. $1.50 in some of these races where Mon Bay was going around the same price as a far more proven horse a couple of years ago. Yeah, exactly. Let's move on to the Macmillan Equine Feeds uh, Flying Mile. It was on the same night, mm. of course, and this race was uh, flipped on its head by those colours you first had a look at there, the Telfer Barn, and that allowed this horse, Chase Auckland, to get over the top, Michael. Don't often see this uh, coming from near last in a feature mile at Cambridge, and look, I, I, th I still think the best version of Chase Auckland is over the shorter trips. I think maybe as he gets old, older, he'll handle some staying distances. I don't think he's a bad stayer. I well, think. he showed that in the New Zealand yeah, Cup, didn't exactly. he? Exactly. He's been very good in the New Zealand Cup, but I think he's so naturally brilliant that he's very good over the short trips. I like the tactics here from the Telford team. They had every right to drive those horses Check out they in, wanted. Triple Eight, step up. They all went great races, and they've all got um, you know placed form and a good time. They broke 155. They gave themselves a chance. That's what they did. Whereas if they had, had they been handing up to Mark Shard and the fixer and stuff, they probably had no chance. Now, so, obviously, the fixer had a problem with his foot, but he lines up shoe. this week. Yep. He cast a shoe, he's fine now, lines up in the Casey Classic on Saturday night. But so, some people watching that race would have thought, well, what's going on here? But if you've got an open-class horse, you've earned your right to park at anybody you want. You park someone out in an open-class race with a, a two-win horse, well, then you're a pickle. But if, you can, if you've got a horse who's won ten races... You've earned your right to do whatever you want. Yep. So I've got no issues with their tactics at all. They did the best thing by the horses. Let's get into some of the country cups. And, well, they moved the Nelson Cup to day one. I actually quite like the idea. And this very good uh, mm -hmm. race filly she was, and now Mia Kendra was expertly handled by Blair Orange on this occasion, came out of the trail. It's the one you wanted to be on right about now. And continues what was an excellent sort of two-week period for the Hope Stable, which actually got better at Ballarat last week. Really successful down south. This is a totally different part of the island. 
I, I take my hat off to Greg and Nina. I, I don't imagine they've got that many staff. I can't imagine there's that many people working there. So the logistics of taking horses all the way down to the deep south and having them racing here, and then of course sending AG's White Sox to Australia where Greg is, Hell of a thing to do. It, it, it takes a lot of pulling off, so good on. Well, number five from just 25 starts uh, for her. She's owned by Greg and Nina and Peter Bacon, who we've used his name a lot in the last 12 to 18 months. And um, she's done a good job and she backed that up with a pretty handy sort of performance on the second day as well. Bring it on home was the horse that took this out. And again, they're using their brains here. So they had the cup the first day, then they raced over a mile. Have a look at the finishing burst for Bring It On Home here. That's him throwing his head in the air in the Regan Todd colours. Storms home here. 152.2. We've always known Nelson to be a fast track. Have a look at the way he finds the finds the line here, Michael. Taxman, bring it on home, late, flashing home. Got up. Bring it on home. Where did he come from? So another example of the training ability of Regan Todd here. Of course, this one formerly with uh, Crandall Getty, and he was just uh, crying out for room. And of course, Taxman ran second, so a Quinella for Regan, and he's formerly from the All Stars Bar. Yeah, and that's what happens when you have a beach training facility. Some people can say, well, this horse is better suited with you, and that's proven to be the case. I like the scenario of the staying test on the first day into the sprint trip on the second day. You can't do it the other way around, but you can do it this way. And again, that's been successful New Zealand Cup into the free-for-all, which raises the question, again, <laughs> why don't we do it with the Dominion? Yep. Staying test into a sprint trip, that's the best version of it, because sprint trip into a staying test doesn't work because no one wants to start in the sprint trip. All right, we started off the show talking about the Centro Otago Cup and hats off to the Southerners for transferring that race. It wasn't called that, but it had the same stake and it was run last Thursday. And this horse, Heisenberg, well, his performance since winning the age pace at Kaikoura and his consistency, he beats Nandolo here, is a real credit to the horse. Gee, he's done a great job. He's now won six races and 150,000, and they smash the clock here, Michael. New Zealand record, 252.4. When they get down there in the deep south, this time of the year, Greg, when it's really warm, gee, they can run some time. And, and horses like him and Nondola are important, and I hope they're retained in the country. Just to, to, to have them in New Zealand Cups next year and to have them in Easter Cups this year, and, and to have some depth to open class and depth of horses trained by other people who aren't the All-Stars. I hope we retain these horses. I know it's hard for the connections because you're winning money but you're not winning stacks of money and if you said this horse is going to win 200,000 in the next two years or you can have 200 now up front, which one do you want? And a lot of people choose the second of those two things. But really good horse. Um, I think he might be a better horse next season as well because a couple of times this season he sort of floated towards the line and been a bit either mentally or physically weak. But I, I do think that next season, with a, a good hard year of racing under him, Greg, he'd be a worthy horse for a New Zealand Cup. Yep, so congratulations to Team Dunn there. And of course, Tim Williams was doing the steering. By the way, the, the stake money from that race, um, predominantly from, from the trainers and the uh, owners, uh, they donated to... Um, to, to the Ricky May scenario. Basically, basically yep. a Ricky May type fund. Thing. Yep. So looking after the people who are involved in the helicopters. St. John's and, John's and all that John's sort of stuff. Sort of yeah. Thing. Which what, I thought, yeah, very commendable. The Gordons. What, yeah. what wonderful thing. And the do. Duns. Well yep. done to them. Yep, big thing. Billy Badger needs you now. It's been a good family and a, and a, a good family for the Duns. So, good um, running family. They're, yep. like they're, they're running horses. So. Definitely. All right, let's uh, head to Blenheim. Stars tonight, we saw finishing third in the Nelson Cup. Didn't start the second day, turned up both days uh, here on the grass, of course, at Blenheim. And uh, this horse here has really developed into a good staying type and, and performing like this means that come the premier meetings at Addington and sort of March and April and through to May, um, he's going to be very competitive, a good start. I think the grass tracks suit him. He doesn't have the cleanest gait in the world and he... I wouldn't be surprised if he touches a knee. It looks like he does. No, he does, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, I think the grass tracks are great for those horses and gives them options where once you speed them up and put them on an all-weather track, often those gate deficiencies can be more exposed. This is him winning the second day, beating his stablemate uh, Hayden's medal, and that's Dad and Dave going another honest race out wide into third. But Stars tonight was uh, simply too good and dead set bolted in. 
in the 100 years. Yes, the centenary uh, Marlborough Cup there on the grass on Sunday. So pretty dominant uh, performance talking, from him. Talking so, about the grass, what about some of the crowds for the grass track meetings? Motokarara being one of the biggest ones, but gee, there's been some massive Well, crowds. they were back to... Eight, nine thousand there. Their yeah. turnover was enormous. Just so. being massive. It's an incredibly important part of the industry. It's not my cup of tea. I'm not a big grass punting person, but they don't run the industry for me. It's run for oh, people. Don't they? When, did that, when did that happen? <laughs> Recent development. Disappointing, <laughs> to be honest. But, uh, what but about heavyweight here? You talked about uh, Todd McFarlane before. Here's a bit of a fill up for him because he's fronted up both days. Uh, day one off 35 metres. Day two of 45, and this has been an inspired decision by uh, Todd, Aaron Lowe, and the other connections of this horse because, um, gee, he's he, he's just dominated them here. He can go around at Addington Raceway through to the races like the Trotting Championship, and um, left-handed he's loving, and, and, yeah, look at him here. He's just... Pfft. He's just dead set bolted in on both days. Uh, this is the second day performance too, so it didn't make any difference going back another uh, 10 metres. He went back there with Amaretto's son. Um, it usually doesn't. This, yeah, this is the um, family of running on time and lot 152 at the yearling sales. Now they're coming up, Michael. Only next month it is. Uh, there's a Bay Colt by Cadabra for sale. Um, a half to this horse here. So, um, yeah, good luck too. Uh, Gail Murray selling that one and um, couldn't have been a better time for this horse to be performing uh, up to that level. Well, and he's a horse you, you know can run open class speed, so maybe getting down there, getting his confidence back, no reason he can't turn up in a trotting championship and be a danger or come back home to the Anzac Cup or the Row Cup. Uh, I think he's a horse that we all thought would get there. Maybe, maybe he will. Maybe he's a horse who this will build his confidence back to those levels, but... That next level was very, very strong, as we'll see when we look at the field for the Dullard Cup later in the show. All right, speaking of butts, Bob's doing a great job with him, and he's getting these horses now that, you know, he needs a flagship horse, and this one's the one that he's got at the moment that's um, that doing a good job. And he's, and he's pinch hitting a bit more too, driving Dad and Dave and these types of horses, so um, good well, luck to him. We, we sent a horse down to him over the winter. Kratos went down there for the sale series and the... Um, and the the jewels, jewels and, yep. and Bob was fantastic. Mm. Like you know, he went from the Dicky stable, who are a, a, a world class trotting stable, down to Bob's, and the horse lost nothing at all. So, uh, from my limited experience on how he trains and what he does do with his horses, absolutely no pot on him at all. He he handled himself very very well. Um, yearling sales time, you had a chance to go through the catalogue in any great depth. Or, I'm picking not I have. given. I, yeah. have, I don't see anything different happening from last season. But I don't, that's not neither good nor bad. The sales have been very strong for the last 10 years. A couple of little blips along the way, but they've been very strong. I don't see a whole bunch of new owners coming in. I don't see a whole new breed developing. It's not like you go, wow, that family's all, sort of all sexy all of a sudden. But, Greg, the sales are going to be very deep again because our horses just keep producing all the time, as we're going to hear and see when we head across to the Australian videos coming up shortly. But... Yeah, I would say the sales should be very similar to this time last year, maybe with just a few little you know, bumps in prices because most of the big players now, the Emilio Rosati's and the Gene Feces, are sort of getting to the level where they're happier to spend over 100 into the 150 range. Where we went through a little period about three or four years ago where 100 topped most horses out. 100, 110 people up there. Last year, 150 to 190 was that new range. So I think that absolute top end market, Greg, is going to have those five to ten horses, whereas five years ago there might be one or two in that market. All right, look forward to building into the sales, of course, out of Caraca and in Christchurch in February. Short break for us when we come back. We'll cross the ditch because there's a lot happening over there. To your box seat. Before we get into all things Australia, Dexter done while we were away. Seven out of the first nine races at the Meadowlands. It was a pretty auspicious start. I, I think he's got a really good chance of winning the Premiership. Now, the Premiership in the US is based on money. It's not based on drives because some people drive at tracks where they win five at night type thing. But Dexter has started the season like a hurricane and he's got a really good chance of, of winning the Stakes Premiership because 
I think now more big stables are thinking, right, I'm happy to have him on, as happy as, say, Yannick or some of those guys. So um, lots for the Dunn family to be proud and of, we'll both keep there and here. And I'm what's going on uh, in that yeah, regard. We might, do we might pop up there at some stage and go see him. Oh, sounds like a great idea, Michael. Yes. Yeah, nice. Right, let's get in uh, to the Ballarat Cup. Of course, the key lead-up race for mine, anyway, heading towards the AG Hunter Cup. And speaking of AG, AG's White Sox in... What has been a rather tumultuous three weeks for this horse. Uh, he finds the front here in the hands of Greg Sugars. We'll catch up with uh, co-trainer Greg Hope very shortly. And once he found this position on a night where the leaders dominated Michael, and we saw what he was able to achieve during the Inter-Dominion series, um, he was always going to be very hard to beat. Yeah, well, look, I'm surprised he was fit enough to win this because he had the no race at Omakar, of course, when, when Ricky had his incident. So... He actually hadn't raced since the Inter-Dominion final, and yet here he is, kicking clear. So he's on the inside, out wide, second from the outside of your screen, self-assured. Didn't get a card into the race, outside him, Chase Auckland. So the Kiwis, one, two and three, second and third, excellent, but AG's White Sox is the horse who worked pretty darn hard that first 300. And as I said, Greg, let's not forget, he missed that race at Old Macau, um, in the most unusual of circumstances. So I was surprised he could be fit enough to win in a 155 mile rate. Really good training performance by Greg and Nina. Yep, and we're lucky enough to be joined online. Back in New Zealand he is uh, by co-trainer uh, Greg Hope. First of all, congratulations, uh, Gregory. That was uh, a very good performance by your horse. Home in 54.7. There might be some talking about those who finished second and third in their performances, but you must have been wrapped in your guy. Oh, definitely, Greg. Yeah, no, he went super. as um, wrapped with his performance. Yeah, I mean, you know, he hadn't raced for a while, but uh, we trialled him um, uh, 10 days earlier and we were happy with the trial, so we, we were reasonably confident that he was up to the mark. Yeah, let, talk me through the process. Obviously, he goes down south, doesn't get that race there. Was Ballarat always on the cards, or did you have to sort of reshape your plan? How did it all pan out? Uh, the idea was to go to Omaha. If he raced good there, we were going to um, going to race the Ballarat and the Hunter Cup, of course. But um, yeah, we we sort of um, well, we knew that he he wasn't far away. That he was sort of fairly well up to the mark. We just gave him a quiet run at the trials, and he he won that really nice, and yeah, he gave us enough confidence to have a go. All right, you had to have a change of driver, and I'll, I'll just touch on the Ricky May scenario with you because. Being your horse and the incident, uh, uh, the medical incident that happened on the 2nd of January, um, that must have been fairly traumatic for you, Nina, Ben, the entire uh, crew surrounding AG's White Sox as well. Oh, definitely. We didn't want we didn't want AG to be the horse to be remembered for the horse that Ricky died on. You know, like I ran over to him and I I definitely thought he was dead. I I mean I. I thought there was no coming back from it, really. It was an amazing uh, feat by um, everybody that saved him, really. I mean, uh, yeah, it was it was horrifying to watch. And, you know, I went to the stipe straight after, and I said, I'm scratching my two. I'm not racing them later in the day. And they said, oh, I'll just hold off. I think we'll uh, put the meeting off. But, um, yeah, no, it was a um, horrible watch. Yeah, the turnaround's been remarkable. You'd have been buoyed by the interview that we've played on the show um, tonight. But have you heard from the wee man? And is he thinking about what he's possibly missed out on percentage-wise? Because we all know Ricky loves the coin. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. He rang us. Um, he rang us when he came out of conscious a couple of days afterwards, and and was um, yeah annoyed that you know he said the horse would have won, and uh, sorry that we didn't get the money, and um, <laughs> and all apologetic, and um, and also thinking that the club had missed out and um, the turnover of the last three races, but uh, that's tricky thinking about the dollar. Yeah, and of course, uh, since the Ballarat Cup, he would have been pleased to see the horse win that as well, because he's got great admiration for AGs, hasn't he? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. No, he, def he texted us after the race, and um, yeah, no, he'd be as pleased as anybody for the horse to be winning. Greg, you're off to the Hunter Cup, so I, I presume you would think the horse would improve after racing in the Ballarat Cup. As I said, his first race for... A month, so is there a chance the better version of him might turn up at Melton in ten days' time? 
I've got no doubt that he'll be a, an improved horse, Mick. He um, was through travelling like I, I was originally going to fly from um, uh, Christchurch to Sydney and with the, the smoke and the fires and the risk that, you know, the trip might take longer when I get on the other side of the island, um, get to Australia, I decided to drive the horse to um, Auckland and just fly direct to Melbourne. So, um in the process, he actually had three days off uh, the week leading into the race, so it was an ideal pro- um, process. But um, he is like a galloper to train. He's fairly, uh, he's very natural, and I just felt that um, you know I didn't really, I didn't have to do too much because he was stressing enough for the trip. So based on that, you would think now that he's settled in at Sugars, he'll be a lot better here. Yeah. Greg, if he comes out and, and performs really well in the Hunter Cup, is there much chance you would head up the road to Sydney for the Miracle Mile? Uh, yeah, that's always been the, the plan, you know, but, I mean, obviously it could turn pear shape if, you know, for one reason or another he doesn't settle like he should do in Australia. But at this stage, um, based on, on what he's done and how he is settling in, um, I think it's a, a definite, really, that we'll try and have qualified for the Miracle Mile, yeah. Greg, the stable's been going super both down south and at Nelson and, of course, now at Ballarat. For our viewers at home, our first show back for 2020, what's the most likely next winner from the stable coming up some stage in the next 10 days, Greg? Because lots of us have credit card bills after Christmas (laughs) and we need your help. (laughs) Okay. Um, well, I must say that uh, should be pretty pretty hard to beat on Friday night. Um, we've got some uh, nice three-year-old trotters coming through that are, um, are definitely going to um, do good jobs later in the season. But yeah, must say, um, must say that looks like the most likely. Uh, I think the next one off the cab. All right, trolled really nicely the other day. Awapuni's one of those ones I wanted to ask you about. Was a winner on the second day uh, at Marlborough and a family out of uh, Loch Nay that Ben Smith had good success with. The next one's called Awapuni. Uh, sorry, Awapuni into Tarapa into Takanini. What's going on there? Is it is this to uh, stop the the galloping trade of some of his horses or what? I'm I'm going to have to ask Ben this. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not too sure what the story is there. I hope, I hope they don't end up being gallopers anyway. But uh, no, she's a lovely filly, and we uh, we were hoping that uh, we were setting her for the race on the first day at Blenheim, and for one reason or another, she galloped at the start, which was a bit of a bugger. We would have loved to have won our own race that we sponsored, but um, she uh, she turned around the second day and and shown what she's capable of, so that was great. And of course, Kendra, winner of the Nelson Cup, I assume she's going to the Premier Mares and and the the Group One race as well, the Breeders. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's the direction we're heading. All right. Well, the stable's certainly firing up. Um, we really appreciate. When do you go back? Uh, you're coming on tonight. When do you go back to Australia, Greg? Uh, probably Saturday, yeah. Just uh, this week, he's just going to bounce around on the lead. Um, they've got a hill track at um, at Greg's, and I, I I didn't want them to do too much, so he'll just bounce around on the lead this week, and um, and then I'll get there to um, hobble him up. And um, yeah, no, he uh, I know that he is settling in really great and eating great, so um, I, I I definitely think there's. Yeah, there's a bit more improvement, and there'll need to be, you know. Obviously, the others will step up as well. Yep, they certainly will. Hey, thanks so much for your time, uh, Gregory. All the best over the next 10 days. Great, thanks, mate, and Greg. Catch you. All right, that's uh, Greg Hope, and it is good to get that insight. <laughs> if the horse improves, that'll be that'll be remarkable, really, the because... The story's remarkable. <laughs> I mean, is... I thought it was stuff, the horse. Yep. Like, Chris, um, New Zealand Cup time, I thought, this thing's stuffed. And if, if it had been my horse, I would have sold him. Mm. And they kept him. And they're, they're reaping the rewards and good on them for having the faith. If there could be a great story for harness racing in 2020, if there could be a tear jerker, if Ricky May one day drives AG's White Sox to win another race. Yep. That's what I'm hoping I get for 2020. I want to eat some other things too, but that's one that thing would I would be pretty like cool. to get. Yep. yep, definitely. All right, uh, another short break for us when we come back. A whole lot more on uh, your box seat as we continue the first show of 2020.
Your box seat continues. A couple of books you need. This one, yearling sales, of course, Auckland, 16, 17, and 18, 19 in Christchurch. I don't need it, Gregory. You don't need it? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Every don't time I pick that. up that book, it costs me a lot of money. What about money? this book here that I got my hands on? So, so speak to me about Bob this. Bob Smolensky has put together a book. It's got John Morrison, 2019 Junior Driver of the Year. There's a forward there which talks about all of... There's a photo of you in there, Brand. Mm, mm, that's yeah, a brand. So, um, so, so this is about... Um, this is John's his season. It's got all his wins and everything in there. I'm not really too sure what inspired Bob to do this, but I'll tell you what, it's worth a read. And if you want one, probably hey. get hold of John Morrison. Good luck to him. Oh, I love that. No, get hold of Bob Smolensky. Oh, 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 I haven't got Bob's number. Oh, okay. I have somewhere, but, but that's anyway, great, Bob. You'll get it. I love seeing dedication to the cause, and it's nice to see a young guy like John's season sort of remembered, and, and people can get a version of that, so that's it's cool. Yeah, Good excellent. Hey, well, there should be actually more publications on harness racing, because back in the old days when Ron Bisman was around and, and Dave Cannon, they used to have the trotting annual, and it was yeah. fantastic. I used to get it as a kid for Christmas. I was over the moon. Mm. And, and I know the market's not there for these days, but... It'd be great to see occasionally more books come out on some of these things. I mean, well, they came out of nowhere, which is yeah, yeah, good on you, Bob. Like good it. luck to you. Yeah. Um, let's get into Australia and uh, the Oaks and Derby. Of course, are on in Queensland and uh, Victoria, rather. So let's go back and have a look at the first heat and stylish Memphis, who of course is a quasi all star at the moment because the elite racing team of Mark Jones and Brendan Hill sent her over, and she was quite brilliant in an outstanding time here, Michael. What this doesn't show is that is it. Mark Purden attacked for the lead in the middle stages and didn't get it. Anthony Butt was really keen to hold the lead on Dr. Susan. And then he went again, and she could get very fiery. And she was getting too fiery, so he had to go twice. But she actually won this pretty easily. Dr. Susan gets out late. But I don't think the best version of Stylish Memphis is in front. And I don't think Mark actually intended to end up there. But all the other horses pulled back at the start. He ended up outside the leader and had to keep going. So... Earplug she, still in. She's very, very fast. We know that. The problem for her is second line barrier draw in the Oaks, which is over 2760 this week. So it's, it's, it's longer than it used to be. Now, here's the Australian who, who won the other heat. They only had two heats of the Oaks. Majita, she was the best two-year-old fully over there last year. Uh, to the eye and on the clock, she was not as impressive. Now, she'll improve more because she was fresh up last year. That's the horse in front. And... She was a very good two-year-old in quite an average crop last year. But I think the New Zealand trained fillies, because of course Dr Susan is trained by Nathan Purden and Crandell Getty, albeit Anthony Butt looking after the horse. I think that they're better than her. Now she's drawn the second line too. Dr Susan's been the huge winner in the barrier draw. Quick off the gate, should lead from barrier five. Um, Majida and Stylish Memphis will have to come around the field. There's no depth to this field. Um, but what really aids the Kiwis is the step up in distance. Used to be 22.40, up to 27.60. Our horses are, are rock hard. The Australians are still coming into their season, Greg. So what price would you back Stylish Memphis at then? Because we're about to see. Here's the, here's the market for it. Dr Susan, logical lead at $2.30. Now, if you'd said to me a month ago she would be favourite over Stylish Memphis in this race, based on the way they performed at Alexandra Park, I would have said, well, that's just ridiculous. The scenario here is, though, that Dr Susan leads, Stylish Memphis sits outside her for the last lap. The question has to be asked, which one will win? Well, that's if she can get outside it. So they're 2.30 a pair. There you go. Well, that's too short for Stylish Memphis and where she is. She's top pick in the race for me, but Dr Susan's going to be on the speed covering a lot less ground. Now, 27.60 is a long way around Melton. That's five different bends you go around, two lengths of, two lengths of bend. Stylish Memphis may need to be 10 lengths better. There's two situations here. Yeah, she gets outside the leader. She probably beats her. But it's really easy to sit here and think, well, no, no, on the Alexander Park form and Addington form, that won't be happening. But it doesn't happen that way. Often horses go to Australia and some just grow a leg. They thrive. Yeah. Exactly. Some horses love that on the speed racing. And it's not as, it's not as conducive to swooping Australian racing. Particularly not in this field, because here's the problem for Stylish Memphis. Pressure. Exactly. No pressure and no cart into the race. It's not like over here where there's lots of good horses and they keep coming. Those fillies aren't very good. No, not, not compared to the So over half here. the field aren't capable of moving not and being in the finish. Well, yeah. No, uh, over half the field's going to be beaten at the 400. Especially over the 2700, yeah. So Stylish Memphis top pick, but Dr Susan could easily win this. I'm absolutely convinced one of the Kiwis will win. 
that's with no bias at all, the market suggests that. Our horses are so much harder and fitter than theirs at this stage of the season. A lot of these Australian horses are just having their second start back. Well, how can you compete with horses who have been racing Amazing Dream? So uh, one way or the other, it's going to be a, uh, a a barn who probably isn't going to have too many people there. Cran or Nathan aren't, you know, aren't probably yep. going to be there. And, and Mark and, and Benny probably won't be there. No. But smart move. They've picked the Very right smart. race to go to. Yep. Dead right. Let's get into the derby. Three heats, uh, starting off with Pacifico Dream winning uh, the first one. 59 sevens, so a couple of seconds slower uh, than what stylish Memphis went, but um, pretty handy sort of performance. Got the lead. Uh, there's Mark Da Vinci sitting in the trail. Doesn't get a gap because there's no passing lane at Ballarat. It obviously worked its way into the final. This is a decent horse, Pacifico Dream, but probably only rated the second, third or even fourth best of the Emma Stewart trained horses. So... I'll be stunned if I could win a derby final yet. That's and Kate Gath driving for Emma Stewart. That doesn't happen too often. Well, she started a little bit recently, about three months ago, and Emma has started to diversify her drivers because often she has three or four in a race. And she's gone to some of the younger female drivers quite a bit. So, um, yep, they're always trying to think, Emma and Clayton, but Chris Alford's still their main man. But, of course, Gavin Lang has been sidelined by illness, and therefore that's taken a major... Um, weapon out of their arsenal. Governor Jujon took out heat number two and did it like this, uh, Michael. Second and a half quicker, Homan 56 3, and uh, Grant Dixon trains and drives a Derby heat winner. This is a good horse. He's not a very big horse, but he's already won races at Albion Park, Menangle, here at Ballarat. Can get on the speed, is well drawn, and he's a lot fitter than most of the Australians. So he, he, he can win the Derby. So he's got a real chance. He doesn't look a derby winner. When you look at him there, he's not a big, robust horse. But he's got a good chance this week. Not a great chance because he's drawn outside lineup, who we're about to see. But he is a horse who is going to be fit enough to cop the 27-6. All right, we saw all night Ballarat. We normally see this in thoroughbred racing, but the on-speed bias was quite remarkable. And uh, lineup, who ran third in the Sire Stakes final on Cup Day, to be fair to him, he's probably underperformed since then, but this was an awesome display. Remarkable thing here is, his winning time was almost exactly the same as AG's White Sox. And including the sectionals coming home. What happened at the start of the race was, he led and Mark Purden attacked on Smooth Deal and lineup got quite racy, so Anthony decided to keep the lead. Now Smooth Deal then tucked his neck and then another horse came round bad to the bone who qualifies for the final by running fourth there. And then Smooth Deal really tucked his neck and half choked down. Now he's had a wind operation, Smooth Deal. So he, he got himself in a situation where his breathing wasn't right. And Craig Demler, who was driving bad to the bone, notified the stewards of that and said the horse behind me wasn't breathing right. He dropped out and ran six. Now he was the pre-post favourite. He's out of the derby. He's gone. Really rare for the All-Stars to take a horse to a derby prelude and not get into the final. Um, the B Huppy Mark. Vincent, did that happen to Vincent? When no, Vincent won. Vincent won his heat, went to the final, got and checked, then they checked got at a dollar out of it. 10, That's exactly and right. And his sulky yeah. wheel got flattened. That's right. Yeah. So uh, I know because I was on. Um, <laughs> good times. Um, with lineup, sorry, by the way, B Huppy Mark was heavily backed in that race, and, and the wave of money came for him, and it was one of the most ludicrous things I've ever seen. I, mean, I remember getting. I almost got on Twitter and mentioned it, but I try not to tweet much about my opinions on races anymore because the bookies just use it to, to bung the odds. I gave it no chance of winning the other Be Happy Mark. Fresh up over 2,710. These New Zealand horses are so fit, and we saw that with Lineup. Now, Lineup's really interesting because clearly he's arrived, he's now trained by Anthony Butt, and he's in the zone. He just, he just loves Australian racing. He's not a big horse. Uh, he loves being on the speed. It just writes itself for him. It just perfectly suited. So here's the market all of a sudden. Horse who paid thirty dollars the other day. He's now he's seen. <laughs> flip of the coin. Two point one to win the final over General uh, Governor Jujon. The question for me with lineup is, if he gets attacked early by Governor Jujon and gets up on the nickel, that's an issue for him. Now here's the other crucial part. In the market, you can see on your screen right now. Be happy, Mark is first emergency. Now. I Emma know Stewart he, has how many in it? Well, technically he's trained by Clayton Tonkin, yes. who's Emma's partner. But I wouldn't be stunned if another horse was scratched and he got into the field. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But it wouldn't stun me if it happened. No. But if lineup produces that level again, racing on the speed, 
he can quite possibly win. Yep. Mark Da Vinci in there, of course, for Paul Court. Well done to Paul. Bad to the bone. The race. Bad to the bone for Barry, and Zach will go across and probably drive this week. I would think Zach's going to be there driving Mark Shard. But so it follows our Soho Hamilton. Early speed there. Well, not enough. Not enough. No, not yeah. to get away. So it, it's incredible to think that Smooth Deal, who would have smashed line up in the Sale Series at, uh, at Alexander Park had he not got checked out of the race, is out of the derby and lineups now the favourite. But when you take these horses to Australia, Greg, small track racing, some thrive, some love it, some don't, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. But I would say a New Zealand trained horse should win both these classics, again, because our horses are fit and rock hard and the horses they're racing aren't, with the exception of Governor Jujon. He's the one horse who is fit enough to be a factor. OK, let's move on to the Trotters. Don't forget, Saturday night to Massive Night, you'll be able to tune in, catch the Oaks, the Derby, uh, the Casey Classic, and, of course... Uh, Self-assured's in the Bonanza. And so the, yep, the Dullard Trotters Cup, who has Massive Metro, Oscar Bonavina, and Temporale. Yeah, so. uh, and Self-assured, who was obviously luckless, as we saw earlier, in the Ballarat Cup, returns to racing the four-year-olds. And if he wins this race from barrier four wins this race, he's automatically into the Chariots of Fire, and that gives him a lot easier path into the Miracle Mile. So, um, beaten for the first time from a mobile last week, but very, very good in being beaten. I'll be surprised if he doesn't win this week. Lock and Bar Art would seem to be his biggest danger there. Cochrane Cup was run as well. Dance Craze, uh, out of La Cucaracha, of course, beautifully bred. Uh, beat Tornado Valley. Came to the Jewels a couple of years ago. Um, had a bit of lucky. It was a bit of mucking around at the front end of the field. Got the lead. Tornado Valley actually missed the start of the race. It was very bizarre for a good gate speed horse. Actually missed away by about 15 metres. And there's Wobbly, who also came to the Jewels, running third. So Not much between them, but I just get the feeling. Our horses, Massive Metro, Oscar Bonavina, Temperale. I'm not saying they're at a different level, but I, I, I just think they're better than these horses. It's going to be really interesting leading towards the Great Southern Star, which... I found out from Phil Williamson last night, and you'll be loving this, his trotter, his star trotter. Majestic Man's is going hitting across. There. Yeah. You know, One hit wonder, bang. You know, it's, I agree with you. I think the New Zealand horses are better, but there's not a great deal of proof of that. This time last year, Temperale and Markula and a whole bunch of other New Zealand horses went across there. And, and got backside kicked. And got their ass yep. kicked by Dance Grace. Yep. Dance Grace is pretty darn good. Tornado Valley won the Inter Dominion 50, 13 months ago, yep. beating Speeding Spur. Yeah. So it's just hard to beat their horses on their track because the one thing they do have is Dance Craze and Tornado Valley have been banging heads a little bit, so they're fit enough to compete with the trotters. The other thing is too, the open class trotters, unlike the three-year-olds we mentioned earlier, they have had a lot of hard racing, hard, hard racing. Now, Oscar Bonavina hasn't, and Massa Metro and Temperale missed the New Zealand Cup Carnival, but some of these other horses have had pretty darn hard seasons, so it's not just a walk up and, and beat them thing. Oscar Bonavina might be too good, but just remember, the national trot, he wasn't good enough to sit parked and win, and he might need to do that here. I think he'll probably win. I'm not taking odds on to find out. Big weekend of harness racing ahead, back to headquarters, Addington, uh, Auckland, and of course Invercargill, and it is Cup Day down there. We had a look back at some of those uh, country cups, including Heisenberg, Beacon, Nandolo. Another good clash between this pair. Uh, who do you like in this? It's, it's hard to argue that Heisenberg won't beat Nandolo again, but I do think Nandolo can beat him if the race pattern works out for him. And okay, this who's, is his who, chance. Who's the better horse, Heisenberg or Nandolo? Well, the way he's going, you'd have to say Heisenberg. He's had, he's had an awesome last couple of months, but I'm happy to be on Nandolo this week. I think he can win. All right, what about the rest of the race week uh, for you? And uh, we'll have a look around the country and see where you need to be. $30,000 turbo pick six with Addington. Like the idea, 5.54 start time there. Eight races at Alexandra Park. Addington Raceway have 10. Good program as well. Leads into the Premier Mayors next week. Uh, 5.12 the start time. And some of those mayors are going around on Friday night too. Uh, Invercargill, $30,000 on the line there, 434 in the race we've just talked about, the Ascot Park Hotel Invercargill Cup, which has been going since 1925, and the best record in the race, 
Blair Orange. He's won it six times. Banks Peninsula Paces Cup, $13,000 there on Sunday, 12.24. We've got a couple of harness meetings on Sunday because Rotorua, including the Rotorua Trotters and Paces Cups there. And that's on the grass, of course, Michael. And I think, is that the only grass track meeting? I think. Yeah, they're gone in the north. They're not the as north. successful in the north as the South Island anyway, to be honest. What about this? Um, a mate of mine sent me the other day um, this vision of what a couple of kids have been doing over in Greymouth, funny enough. And isn't this great? This is Arthur and Lewis Lilly from Greymouth, my hometown. And they were watching the trots at Ashburton on Christmas Eve. And like we all did with kids and you, you love it. <laughs> the middle picture is the field for the Ashburton Cup. Now, admittedly, it's not to scale, but yes. That one was, by Heisenberg. One by Heisenberg. <laughs> The, the, if we get the picture back up again, we showed this again. The second picture to your far right was actually their version of the tote. They made a Lego tote. The last version, absolute beauty, is Matt Cross commentating. So Matt Cross is commentating, <laughs> but that's him. And as it appears, he would, I think, be Scrooge McDuck or one of the one Duck of them. family. So that is their Arthur and Lewis Lilly's picture. Thank you for your wonderful version of Matt Cross commentating. There's Matt the Duck. Yep. <laughs> nice work. That's Best he's ever looked. <laughs> that's been your box seat. It is nice to be back, Michael. You've got a big week ahead. Uh, Karaka Million. Good luck to uh, Ellerslie too, because that's a, a massive, massive uh, late afternoon, evening there. Well, uh, it's beautiful if you're watching at home. You get to roll into that, put your feet up, go get some takeaways, come back, and then we go again for Melton on Saturday night. So there's going to be some awesome racing on trackside coming up on Saturday. All right, and once again, a big thank you to uh, Ricky and Judy May and allowing us access uh, to them and giving you an insight into what unfolded for him over the last three weeks. And he did want me to mention uh, Craig Wiggins, who helped him out so much uh, through that period as well. That's been your box seat. We'll be back in seven days' time with a whole lot more information for you. Enjoy your harness racing week ahead.